Hey, welcome back. Um, last week we talked about uh, some SE Linux issues and I was really trying to stress that people should first think about sticking stuff into containers um, as an easy way to secure the systems. Um, this week I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a little bit more about containers and, and some really cool tools that we've added to uh, container technologies. Uh, but first I'd like to do a quick uh, history or talk about uh, containers in system D. So uh, many years ago, um, I started looking at how we can integrate containers into system D and system D into containers. Um, and I actually wrote a, uh, this is while we were working with Docker, and I wrote a blog uh, back in May 5th of 2014 um, called How to Run System D Inside of a, um, inside of a Docker Container. The interesting thing there that became sort of the standard way everybody looked at running system d a lot of people wanted to run system d primary in a container um the sad part is that docker was always very anti-system d and really wanted docker to control the world um, but once we created the podman project we really wanted to integrate tightly with system d key things about podman and system d is that podman works on a fork exec process um, which allows uh, the container ends up being a child process of the of the Podman, uh, whereas Docker is a client server. And so the uh, Podman really worked the way normal services worked. And then the container ends up being a, you know, in the ancestry tree of it. So when you put it into a systemd unit file, you know, everything can work together. Systemd can understand what's going on inside of the process. Um, so several other things that are you know, advantages of systemd uh, use with containers is that, um, is that you can take advantage of things like socket activation where system D will actually listen on a specific socket and uh, be able to launch the container and actually leak the socket into the container. So you can actually do some really cool stuff around security with that. Um, other things you can do is you can actually manage the C groups from system D. So system D can look at managing and controlling what's going on in the uh, con container and actually change its uh, memory allocation or change its stuff directly using system D tools. Um, and really system D then can manage the entire life cycle of, of the container. Uh, so originally when we were doing this, we a lot of people wanted to know, okay, how do I run a container under system D? And uh, so we actually created a tool called system D generate uh, uh, container. All right now, Podman system D generate, which, uh, basically would take your running containers on your system would generate a systemd unit file uh, based on them that would be good enough for launching it. The problem with that is that we, when we built that tool, it, uh, it's sort of locked in time the, the best knowledge of systemd and the best knowledge of, of Podman, but now you had a unit file and people always wanted to customize that unit file. Um, and the uh, over time, you know, we've realized that that might have been a mistake and uh, some engineers inside of uh, Red Hat and Vehicle Operating System, Ribos, uh, came along and started developing a new new project, a sub-project in the department called Quadlet. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is introduce uh, Egal Bloom, who uh, formerly of the Ribos project, Red Hat and Vehicle Operating System project, um, is a principal software engineer at Red Hat. And he's now working on AI solutions uh, for uh, Red Hat. Uh, Yigal, welcome. Hi. Welcome to the Thanks podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, Quadlet uh, was introduced about two years ago, I, th I believe. And uh, its its main goal was to um, create um, systemd unit files, but basically created a new interface for uh, that or a new way, sort of a new framework of a unit file. Could you... Uh, talk about it. Yeah, sure. So, like you said, uh, the system gen the system degenerator of Podman was like a time capsule. If things changed in Podman, we, we always had problems with having to regenerate stuff. And basically, by introducing Quadlet, we were able to have a new version of Quadlet. Every version of Podman. So, if things change in Podman, if we learn stuff, if we add new capabilities, they will always go into Quadlet. So if you have a new key and it gets uh, it gets supported, so well that supports that, and then you can add that. Um, in addition, it what it allowed us in, in in addition to having the integration with System D was that it now you now have a declarative way 
to define a podman command. So instead of having to remember all the different key or the different arguments and store a very long line of command that you'll need to remember, uh, instead you have this, this, this uh, declarative file, you define the keys and values, and then something called that creates a uh, creates that command line for you. Um, so I don't have to remember anymore if it's dash V or dash dash volume. It's just I, I set a volume and it's there. And if someone decides to change something in Podman, that's up for them to support my old uh, my old declarative way of defining that pod. Um, so these are the advantages. Um, and and it came yeah from 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 Ribos because we saw the need of running a lot of containers uh, inside with systemd managing them and and they needed a programmatic way to create a file that will uh, um, will define that pod and not have to remember a whole line. Okay, great. Can you guys show us an example of uh, one that you you have running on your system? Sure. So I have a bunch of them. If you look, so the user level one are always stored in like the dot config container system D uh, directory. And if I ls them, you'll see that I have a bunch of them. And I use them quite regularly. A lot of them I use quite regularly. There's like, for instance, the Redis container. So every time I have a uh, an application that I'm running that needs Redis locally, I just spin that up and then I have that running. Uh, similarly, there is one for MinIO. Um, so MinIO, if you don't know it, it's an S3 uh, implementation, and you can run it on your own system, and you get an S3 endpoint to handle. And if I look at the container file, and again, Qualit has different types of file. The most basic one is the dot .container, which defines a container. In addition, there are other, uh, um, other types of files, uh, like network, or um, or image, or we'll see later a, a .q, which uses a Kubernetes YAML. Um, let's look into this. So, for anyone yeah, who this looks like a this looks like a standard uh, systemd unit file, though, right? Exactly. That's what I was about to say. If if anyone who's uh, who's used to see who's used to looking at systemd unit files, will look will see that this is very similar. Because the idea that it, it is a sort, it's an extension to a to a system unit the unit file. So we have the the regular units. So the unit definition, we can define what we want to run. Interesting enough, look at this Prom Prometheus service. We'll look at it soon, but um, we all everybody knows like we know from other uh, units, the targets, the local FS and network online. But the Prometheus, we'll see in them soon that it requires them. Uh, and and also I'm going to jump down just for a second to see to show that we have the install section, we have a service section, we can define other stuff as well. But what Quadlet adds in the dot container file is the container section, and here is where we pass all the key values that eventually will be translated into a Podman command. Um, so what do we have here? So the most like the, the initial and important part is the image. So obviously. We want to set the image that we're going to run. So this is the latest of MinIO. We're also setting the container name because it's easier to find it later. Uh, we want to set the exec because there is also a console. And we're setting some variables now, again, because it's running on my uh, my local environment. I don't mind sharing that this is my super secretive password. Um, yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's not very secure, that password, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it I runs locally, and right. I don't yeah. open it anywhere. So if yeah. if someone wants to hack, okay. if someone got to my computer, they'll get there. But they also got to the okay. storage as well, because you can see that I'm too late just providing that. local storage anyhow. Um, you can pass environment variables. You can pu publish ports. So you can see I'm publishing these two ports, 9000 and 9001. I'm setting a volume. Um, what's also nice is that I can set and exec start pre. So for example, in this case, uh, as you can see, I'm defining a volume. I'm mounting a uh, 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 um, a directory on my local host into the, uh, into the uh, container. But I'm not sure that it exists. So I have an exec start pre uh, that will create this for me if it's not there. Uh, so this is my uh, min.io. And Let's jump just for a second and see that Prometheus service is not just a service. It's also 
a, a container of its own and it has its own stuff. So it has the uh, container name, its image, it opens up a port, it uses a local YAML file for the configuration. And we can see also that in the, the reason that the main reason here to set the container name to Prometheus is that we also use it here when we set the environment variable for where is my Prometheus. So this is how it will find it. As we said, this all translate into systemd unit files. So for the min.io service, we can see that it goes, it will be created in the generator in the generate directory. And a lot of the things will just get copied, but some of them will have new. So the unit is looks the same as before. We also have the what we set there. And the container section is copied into an X container. So system D will disregard everything that it sits on X with a that starts with X. So we don't have to, so we can still copy it here for reference. And then we have our service. And what's interesting, most interesting thing here that was created is the exec start. So this is where the where the magic ends up at. Uh, for Quadlet, it built it generated this line. So it calls podman run, sets the name of the container the way we set it. Uh, it replaces it, it, it defines C groups, it has some uh, default behaviors, the volume, the, the ports being published, the, envir the different environment variables that were set, and at the end, the exec that we set. So this is the line. So you have to agree with me. I also, I also know. Yeah, I also noticed inside of there that, that there's some magic stuff going on. Like the, we didn't see anything about SID files and stuff like that. And that's that's stuff that we, you know, the developers of Podman and have figured out inside of System D how to run properly underneath the System D unit file, so System D can take take over and manage the um, the systems. Yes, a lot of the, cool. the so yeah. yeah the the environment the. Um... The, the type of the uh, service, uh, the, the notification between the service and from the service, from the container into system D, all that is is, is basically defined by uh, some uh, default values that are set in, uh, in Quadlet. Cool. Um, so this is the dot container way of, of configuring stuff, but, uh, but Podman, supports a another way of, of running containers and that using Kubernetes YAMLs. So let's say I have a simple YAML file that I use to run Fedora with. So it's a it's an old container it's an old YAML file used Fedora 38, but could be could have been 40 as well. And all it does is just spins there. So it runs, waits, so I can exec in exec into it. Uh, but I want to be able to run it with uh, as a service. So what I have for it, I have a Fedora cube file. And similar to what we were discussing earlier, the dot container, now the dot cube file. And it's very simple. All I have here is a cube section that points me into the Fedora YAML file. So similarly... So you could basically... So we could share the, this kubeyaml file both between running in a Kubernetes cluster, um, but we can all run it directly into the system D using Podman and Quadlets. That's very yes. I, I can. There is this is something I do many times whenever I need a whenever I need to 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 run a Fedora pod on on my cluster just as a as a as a jump box or something. This is the YAML file that I use. I use it straight from here. Nice. Uh, it's very simple and easy. And uh, what I wanted to show is that similarly, we can, it creates the Fedora service file. And here again, we have the copy of the X cube uh, with, uh, with whatever was set in there. Um, uh, we remember the source path, and then we see again, the, the type of it, how it's notified. And the exec start is queue play. Uh, we set service container that's set automatically to connect between the uh, the the pod and and systemd, and 
the location of the YAML file. Note that in the uh, uh, in the cube file, we only had to set we set a relative path of Fedora YAML, and by default, and there are ways to to override it. Or if you can provide a, a, a full path, or you can also have it uh, uh, depend on uh, different ways of a relative paths. But at the end, this is translated, in this case, to the same uh, um, to the same directory as the original uh, .cube file. So you can have the two files sit together, and then they just point one points to the other, and that's it. You, and it makes the whole files uh, uh, transferable from computer to computer. Nobody cares where because it's all relative. Yeah, so basically, the, the uh, when you did a dot container, it's doing a podman run command in the exact star, and when we do a coop dot um, yeah, so it's doing a podman coop play. You're right. Yeah, miss that. So yeah, when when we use a Q file, we'll we'll use Q play because the input is a uh, Kubernetes YAML file. Very cool. This has become a very popular way of running um, containers on systems, and basically allows us to. Um, maintain, you know, and manage your containers or pods um, underneath system D. And, you know, you don't have to have any human intervention. We don't have to have any special services running. Um, and then system D can manage it. And under Rivos, um, again, we wanted to have lots and lots of these running on the system. So imagine then Red Hat and Vehicle, but you, you start your car and has lots of services that start out. And when you change, you know, put the car in reverse, it will start some services, stop others. Um, and it's all managing underneath Quadlet. And so that's, you know, one use case of Quadlet. And we're uh, seeing many more uh, uses of it going forward um, as, you know, you know, you know, if you're going to be running edge computing, any type of uh, data centers, things like that, that you, you can manage your containers as simply as managing services underneath system D using Quadlet. So thanks very much for the uh, demo, uh, Gal. And, uh, um, I hope to see, uh, I think people should all go on and look at Quadlets and uh, um, play with this. Any last comments that you go? Yeah, we have a, um, we have a demo, uh, an application site under uh, the containers uh, um, uh, organization uh, repos uh, organization on GitHub called App Store. Uh, you can find a lot of uh, examples. Um, hopefully people share more. Um, it's very useful to, uh, to see how uh, different people use Quadlet and take example from it. And that's it. Thank you for having me. Bye now. See you next week.